Good morning. morning. Blessing to be able to be here together, worship God in this way, sing these songs of praise. I'm glad that you and I are able to be a part of that. I want to start by asking you a question this morning. If you were tomorrow morning, say about mid-morning, at your work or at school or at home or out shopping, and someone you'd never seen before came by and said, follow me. Would you do it? I would ask for a show of hands, but I'm afraid somebody might raise their hand. and <laughs> Then we wouldn't know what to think. I don't think any of us would even consider doing that. And so it amazes us, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, when we read that Peter and Andrew and James and John all followed Jesus immediately when he called them. What we're overlooking there is the fact that this was not the first occasion they'd met Jesus. You go to the first chapter of the Gospel of John, and it tells us that, first of all, Andrew had been a disciple of John the Baptist, and that one day John the Baptist saw Jesus, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And so Andrew started following after Jesus, and Jesus said, What are you seeking? And uh, he told Andrew to come with him, and Andrew ended up spending most of the day with Jesus. And then later he went and found his brother Peter, and he said, we have found the Messiah. So this was not their first encounter with Jesus. And then you can look at Luke chapter 5, which is the parallel text to Matthew chapter 4, 18 to 22. And it tells us that on that day when Jesus went to the disciples by the sea and said, follow me, before he did that, he had begun to preach to the crowd, and he got in Peter's boat and had him put out away from the shore. And he used his boat for his podium, and he preached to the people from that boat. And then he told Peter to put out a little further into the deep water and cast his net and see what he caught. And Peter said, we fished all night. We haven't caught anything. And he said, just just do it. And he did, and they pulled in such a great catch a fish that they didn't quite know what to do. So not only had they seen Jesus, not only had they encountered him, before he said, follow me, they had witnessed a miracle. Now, since James and John were present also in Luke 5, they'd witnessed that miracle too. And they may have been there in John 1. We don't know that for sure, but it's likely true of them that they had met Jesus before. So what's happening in Matthew chapter 4 is not that they are encountering Jesus for the first time and following him, but they've met him before, they've heard his teachings before, they know what he's about, and now he comes to them and he says, I want you to join me in my proclamation of the kingdom. Now it's time for you to make a decision and come and follow me. I want us to think for a minute, what were they doing when they made that decision to follow Jesus? What was the process? What were they doing? Number one, they were answering a summons. They were answering a summons. If you get called by the Internal Revenue Service, and I pray you don't, but if you get called by the Internal Revenue Service and they tell you that you need to come in for an audit, are you answering an invitation or responding to a summons? I can tell you from experience, you're responding to a summons because I took it as an invitation once and told them politely that I didn't think I I needed to come. And they told me politely that I could either do that or go to prison. So I went in and, you know, there wasn't anything wrong. There wasn't any issue at all. It was just the third year in a row that they'd audited me. Uh, But it's a summons. You, You know that you respond or else. You know that you respond or else there are consequences to pay. Now, we sometimes speak of inviting people to follow Jesus, but that's really not accurate because he wasn't inviting these men to follow him. He was summoning them to follow him. And so when they did, they were following and answering a summons. Follow me, Jesus said, or face the consequences. Not only were they answering a summons, they were also changing vocations. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with them being fishermen, but Jesus had more in mind for them. He said, if you follow me, I'm going to make you become fishers of men. 
You'll be fishing for people from now on. You'll be joining me in the work of the kingdom of God and proclaiming the good news of what God is doing in his world, calling people into relationship with him. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, Jesus said. You'll be fishing for something far greater than what you've ever done before. That will be their true life's work. So they were changing vocations. Number three, they were walking away. You said they couldn't follow Jesus without leaving other things behind. And you notice it twice in Matthew 4, verse 20. It says that uh, Peter and Andrew left their nets and followed him. And then in verse 22, James and John left the boat and their father and followed him. They walked away from family, the family business. They walked away from being involved with their father in that business and they followed Jesus because they couldn't do it without walking away from what they had been doing and giving him their first loyalty. They couldn't stay in their boats and follow Jesus. So they were walking away. And then number four, they were attaching themselves to Jesus. You look at verse 19, Jesus says, follow me. The Greek literally says, come behind me. Come behind me. Get behind me and follow in step with me. You know, our usual definitions of a, a disciple as a learner or a follower, they're accurate enough, but they, they don't quite plumb the depths of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. Because a disciple of Jesus becomes a companion with Jesus. A disciple of Jesus becomes an imitator of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus lives in Jesus' presence, follows after him, no matter what he's doing or where he leads, as we've just sung. Where he leads, I'll follow. That's what a disciple does. And so that's what he's calling them to do. Come along behind me, he says, and follow me. You see, they're not just to go to Jesus' school and learn some facts. They're not just being called to do something religious. They're being followed to attach themselves to this man and follow him. When I would give exams to my students uh, on, in the Gospel of Luke, I would always ask them about the story of the rich young ruler and say, what did Jesus tell the rich young ruler to do? And, and about nine times out of ten, about nine students out of ten, would say he told him to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. And that's exactly right, but that's not the whole answer. Because the rest of it is, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And if he didn't come and follow Jesus, it wouldn't make any difference what he gave up. It wouldn't make any difference that he sold everything that he had and gave it to the poor unless he followed Jesus. And that's the part that they were missing. Come follow me. Come follow behind me. Come follow after me. The first part is useless without the second. Now, you and I aren't the 12. We can draw some parallels between ourselves and the 12 apostles, as we call them. But there are some things, there are some parallels that can't be drawn. They had an authority that we don't have. They're disciples, we're disciples, but they were also apostles. And the word apostle means one who is sent with authority. And you and I don't have that kind of authority. They were authoritative messengers of Jesus, so much so that in Matthew uh, chapter 10 and verse 1, the Bible says that Jesus gave them authority over illnesses and over unclean spirits when he sent them out to preach the kingdom. He gave them authority. They could go out and cast out demons and they could heal people. And they could do all the things that Jesus had been doing. Matthew 16 and verse 19 says, Jesus spoke to Peter and he said, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys symbolize authority. And then later in Matthew 18, in verse 18, he, gives, he says those same keys, not just to Peter, but to all the apostles, speaking in the plural. I'm giving you guys the keys of the kingdom. So they had an authority that we don't have. And that's quite obvious. So we're all followers of Jesus like then, like they were then. And we're all disciples, but they were the only ones who had that special 
situation of being the apostles. But you and I are disciples too. And so there have to be some things for us to learn about Jesus calling Peter and Andrew and James and John. What can we say that we need to learn and that we need to do based on what they learned and what they did in Matthew chapter 4? Well, the first thing is we, we need to understand that we too have been summoned. Jesus does not invite us to follow him. He summons us. You and I are living in a world that doesn't know God, and God is calling out to that world through the gospel, and he is not saying, if it suits you, and if you don't have anything else to do, and if you haven't already made other commitments, why don't you think about me? That's not where proclaiming the kingdom is. I want you to back up just before our reading for today, Matthew 4, 17. Jesus went about preaching the, this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those folks were not being invited. They were being summoned. And as we live in the world today, we're not inviting people to follow Jesus. We are summoning people to follow Jesus because that summons has eternal consequences. We have a decision to make for or against him. You see, hearing the call of Jesus sets up a crisis for each one of us. We use that word crisis in a lot of ways that, that really are not what the word originally meant. The Greek word crisis means judgment. It means judgment because a, a crisis is a situation where you're being judged. A crisis is a situation where you're forced to decide one way or another and what you decide becomes your judgment. Imagine yourself in a burning building and you're on the fifth floor and the fire is behind you and there are firemen below you, and they've got a safety net, and you have to make up your mind. Am I going to jump into that net, or am I going to take my chances with the fire? Now, I don't know about you, but it would not at all appeal to me to jump out of a fifth-floor window. I don't care what they had down there. I wouldn't want to do that. But neither would it appeal to me to stay in a burning building. You see, that's a crisis. That's where you have to make a decision. That's where you have to be judged about what you're going to do. And when you hear the call of Jesus, when you hear that Jesus died for your sins, when you hear that he rose again from the dead, when you hear that he's coming again to judge the world, you're being summoned. You're being summoned to follow him. And that summons has eternal consequences. It creates a crisis and you have to decide. Now, I know a lot of people, I think most people who don't follow Jesus say, I'm not making a decision. <clears throat> I'm not making a decision. That is a decision. That is a decision. If Jesus says, follow me, and you don't, you've made your decision. If Jesus says, come after me, come along behind me, and follow me, and receive your eternal life, and you don't, then you are making your decision. So not only are we being summoned by the gospel, but that summons has eternal consequences. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. In other words, there's not any neutral ground. There's not any middle course. There's not a place to say, I'm just not going to decide about Jesus. You either are or you are not going to follow him. You know, I'll tell you, I sometimes wonder, we, we have the, the custom, and that's what it is, it's a tradition. It's not something that's required by scripture, but we have the, the custom, the tradition, usually at the end of sermons, of offering what we call an invitation. Number one, we're, we're labeling, labeling it wrongly, aren't we? It's not an invitation. It's, it's, it's repeating the summons, but we do that, and we do it over and over and over, and, and I sometimes wonder if we do it too much. And the reason I wonder if we do it too much is because it may put people in the habit of ignoring it over and over, and over time, you can get hardened to it. Well, there's that message again. Well, there's that invitation again. There's that summons again. There's that call again. I've ignored it 498 times before. I can ignore it today. 
we need to realize that we're being summoned. Don't forget Matthew 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The rulership of God is at hand. Don't think of yourself as being invited into the kingdom. Know that you have been summoned. And you have to say yes or no. Number two, like the disciples, we need to learn that we, we need to change our thinking about our vocation. We don't necessarily need to change our vocation. We need to change our thinking about our vocations, whatever that vocation is. That doesn't mean we have to stop being teachers and accountants and IT people and laborers and salespeople and whatever it is that you do. Jesus isn't calling you necessarily to, to change your, your occupation what he is calling you to do is to, first of all, see yourself as his disciple. And then, as whatever else it is that you do. And that's something that, that takes place largely in our minds and in our, our attitudes. But it makes a world of difference. And instead of saying, I am this or I am that, we say, I am a disciple of Jesus who also teaches. I'm a disciple of Jesus who also sells cars. I'm a disciple of Jesus who also works uh, in a factory. I'm a disciple of Jesus who also does whatever else it is you do. But first of all, you are a disciple of Jesus. We are not people for whom following Christ is a component of our lives. We are people whose lives are all about following Jesus. Our lives are all about following Jesus. And then we are also housewives and students and workers of various kinds. I like the way F.F. F. Bruce put it in one of his books. He said that Jesus was calling people to reassess all of their personal and social values in the light of his ministry. He's calling us to reassess all of our values in the light of his ministry. Everything that we are and everything that we do. That's what he was doing with Peter and Andrew and James and John. That's what he's doing with us. He's calling us to reassess everything in the light of who he is and what he's done. Well, when the apostles heard Jesus' summons, they had to walk away. So do we. We have to walk away from some things. If you're going to respond to the summons of Jesus, you first of all have to walk away from sin. 417, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People couldn't just say, okay, I, this kingdom sounds great. And as long as I can keep doing what I've been doing and do things that, that I want to do, whether they're right or wrong, I'll follow him. No, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he turns around and he says, now follow me. We've got to walk away from sin. We've got to walk away from a lot of things in this world that may appeal to us. You may have to walk away from people who uh, want to stop us from following Jesus or who make it so difficult for us to follow Jesus. We just may need to change the people we associate with. We may need to walk away from them. They won't understand that. That's okay, whether they do or not. But we know what we're having to do. You may have to walk away from religious viewpoints that simply aren't true. I remember one woman that I was, had been studying the Bible with and others here in this congregation have been studying the Bible with her. And she finally reached the point where she said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. Her background was in Buddhism. And I said, so you're ready to leave behind your Buddhism and follow Jesus. And she said, oh, no, no, I want to follow Jesus, but I want to keep praying to the Buddhists. And I said, you can't do that. Because then you're not following Jesus exclusively. You can't follow Jesus and pray to somebody else. You shall have no other gods before me, the scripture says. She never did follow Jesus. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to walk away from some things that aren't true. You have to walk away from whatever might be standing between you and following him. And whatever that is, is something to walk away from. And if there's something that has such a strong pull on you that you find it really hard to walk away from, that's probably all the more indication you need to walk away from it. That it's something that's keeping you from being a disciple of Jesus. 
And then fourth, like the disciples, we have to become attached to Jesus. We have to become attached to him personally. Spending our lives learning from him and imitating him and serving him and loving him. And in the process, becoming more and more like him. So attached to him that no matter what happens, we belong to him above everything else. And we never compromise that fact. Some of you probably have read the book or seen the movie The Hiding Place. It's a story about a Dutch woman named Cory Ten Boom and her sister Betsy. And during World War II, their family who lived in Amsterdam were hiding Jews in, in a hiding place that they had constructed inside their house. They had one of those little tall, like five-story houses and narrow, and they had constructed a compartment in it where they could hide these Jewish people and keep them from being arrested and probably killed. After some time, they were discovered. And it was a crime, according to the Nazi regime, to hide Jews, and so the ten booms were all sent to concentration camps. Life in the, camp, in the camps was horrible. It was horrible not only because of the suffering and abuse that was imposed by their captors, but the people would fight with one another over what meager supplies they could get, and they would get impatient with each other, and they'd get angry with each other, and there'd be, there'd be all kinds of squabbling going on, and all kinds of things. And throughout all of it, Corey and Betsy determined that they were going to keep being like Jesus. Betsy died in the camp, and before she died, she told Corey, don't let hatred take over. Don't let hatred take over. Look to Jesus. Betsy died, and Corey was released at the end of the war. And she wrote the book. The hiding place. You see, a disciple is a disciple. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing. A disciple is a disciple always and everywhere. There's no such thing as part-time discipleship. There's no such thing as following Jesus at certain times and certain places, not in others, even in a concentration camp. Wherever a disciple is, he or she follows the Lord. I want to read these words to you from Jesus about following him. This is from Luke chapter 14, beginning of verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate? whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus is not saying he doesn't want them to be his disciple. He's just saying they don't have it in them because they're not willing to walk away and they're not willing to attach themselves to him. They have other priorities in life that mean more to them. And he's not teaching us to literally hate the people in our lives, but to love him so much that by comparison, we hate everything else. We love it so much less. And notice what that very first verse of that reading said. Great crowds were gathering about him. But Jesus doesn't look for crowds. He never did. And he's not now. What he looked for was disciples. But he said, before you decide to be my disciple, count the cost. Are you ready to follow him? 
He is calling you. Let's stand together and sing. I heard.